what it was. Look, I got fire and desire. I got pain and I got passion. I got lighters and I Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Apostle TV Walker. I want to take this time to welcome you to Live at 5. It's 5 o'clock and it's Wednesday, so I know you know exactly what time it is. It is time for Live at 5. Certainly glad that you are here. We are here to answer some questions today. Get, we got five great questions that I want to make sure we get out to you. Uh, and I want to get some, some answers to you that I hope are going to be a blessing to you and that will enrich you. Let's take a look at question number one. Hi, Mom. Question number one says this. Is it once saved or always saved, or can you lose your salvation? I keep hearing different answers. Glad that you asked that. I've, heard, I've had that question again, uh, but we're not recycling that because I just want to make sure you get some good revelation there concerning this question. And I certainly appreciate you asking. Listen, you know, one of the things that we got to do in order to really get that is to define what a Christian is. Like, you know, a Christian obviously is a saved person, but what's a Christian? Well, a Christian is a person who has fully trusted in Jesus Christ as the only Savior and as well as the only one who has the ability to give them salvation, to, to bring them back into fellowship with God. And that person who is a Christian possesses the Holy Spirit. Let me, let me give you a scripture. It says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. You put your finger there. That's new. The old has passed away or the old is gone and the new has come. All things have become new. That's all things. That Your old life is over. There's now a new life. So the question that you got to ask yourself is this, and I think this is the question. Once you're redeemed, can you be unredeemed? You know, once you are a new creation, can you be unmade as a new creation? You know, will the Holy Spirit decide at one point to dwell in you, to live in you, to, to you know, to take up residence inside your, your body and to guide your life and then undecide for whatever reason there is to do that? The answer to that is absolutely no. You know, when people come to, to know Christ as their personal Savior, they are brought into a relationship with God through Christ that absolutely guarantees their salvation. It is eternally secure. You know, once you're saved, there's no place where you will be uh, uh, unsaved, right? There's no place where you can lose your salvation. Uh, and, and and if you could, I can tell you right now, that would severely limit the power of God's salvation. That would just, that would be a very slight in his ability to actually save us, you know? I mean, it's kind of, it would be very tenuous. Listen, the Bible says this, for by grace you've been saved, through faith. Now, this great, this is God's grace. So, you know, we can even put in there God, right? You've been saved by God's grace, right? Through faith. And this is not of your own doing. The scripture makes it clear. It's a gift of God. So who does it? It's God. So if you, God does something, can you undo what God has decided to do? No man has that power. The Bible says it's not a result of works, lest any man should boast. So salvation is not us just mumbling you know, a couple of scriptures, it's not us trembling down the altar one day we decide, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm ready to get saved, God. I feel like the, the Lord has called me and, you know, I'm going down to the altar. It's not, it's not crying. It's not, you know, some admission of guilt. That's not what it's about. Our salvation is a sovereign act of God. It's a sovereign act of a sovereign God, a holy God. It is not an act of man. God makes a decision to save us. And we need to get that in our hearts and understand that once and for all. God, it is God who, who's decided to forgive this person who we agree is a sinner. It is God who puts a new heart in them. It's God who puts a new spirit in them. Ezekiel 36, 26. I'm going to give this to you again because this is a, a very important question that I hope that you are as locked in on after you get this answer. Here's what God promises. And I will give you a new heart and a new spirit. Remember I said it's God who makes the decision to give the new heart. And the new spirit, he said, I will put it within you and I will remove, that's the old heart, the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. Whoever believes in God, whoever believes in Christ, who, who makes a confession that Jesus Christ is Lord, you have to understand you have what's called eternal life. That's forever. You cannot lose it. That person cannot lose it. And I'll tell you why. I'll tell you, let me give, let me give you a real good reason why. Because you've been made new. Because you're a new, cre a new creature, that whatever you're thinking about the old person, how humans work, and you know we can always go back. That person who is a, a believer is now a new creation in Christ. And here's what Christ promises: You're not going to do anything that, that's going to forfeit. You're not going to. You're not going to leave. Judas was never mine. He left, but Peter, with all the wrangling that he did, with all his violence, he became exactly what Christ said he was going to be. 
you, you're Simon right now, but I'm going to call you Peter. You, you, you're going to be a rock. And certainly that's because God said it, that he, that's what he's going to do in Peter. I'm going to make you a fisher of men. What did Peter become? He became a fisher of men. Titus says this. He says he saved us. Not He saved us, not because of righteous things that we did, but because of his mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal. How? By your baptism? No, by the Holy Spirit. So the scripture reminds us that it's Jesus who saved us in the first place. It, it, his motivation was mercy. It wasn't an end of our works, nothing that we did. So this idea that we can, you know, I'm saved, but I can lose it. You can't lose it because you can't earn it, right? You, you can't earn it. So therefore, once God gives it to you, it's yours. And, and here's the thing that you have to understand. It's the action, whatever thing you think you can do to forfeit salvation, here's what God said about that. This is Romans 8.30, and I want you to get this again. He says, and this is what the Lord says, he declares, and those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. Listen, you need to really get that. This, your salvation actually happened it, before you actually came into being, before you could ever sin, before you could ever think, before your mother was born, before the world was it was here, before one dinosaur was creeping on the earth, before there was ever a butterfly ever created, before there was ever earth, you were predestined to be conformed to the likeness of his son. That's what that's what the Bible says. That's that's Romans eight or twenty nine. That's, that's Romans eight thirty. When you look at what's here, it's clear that the work of your salvation was done before you ever got here. The Bible calls Christ as the lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world. The blood was flowing before Calvary. That's how deep this is. So there's a little truth, though, that we have to understand here, that when we accept Christ, we also are being changed by Christ. And that change is going to be evident in our lives. But that change will lead us to eternal life. You, you can't lose it. Those that are his are his. And not one can be snatched out of his hand. Listen. Hopefully that will help you there. Listen, look at the scripture. I, I'm, I'm, I'm just only proving it to you by the word. Let's look at question number two. Are we supposed to endeavor to bring the church back to the original way of operation or is there a future look of the church that Christ is leading the body to excel to? I like the wording. Yeah, and the answer is yes. There is a future, let me use your last part. There is a future look of the church that Christ is leading the body to. Yeah, we're, we're not going back. There's no way we're going to go back. Listen, the idea of going back is as, is like a uh, an adult, you know, trying to go back and become an infant again. We're not going back to infancy. New birth is wonderful. You know, you see a baby, you know, a, a baby might be at its, what we would look at at its purest, at its most beautiful form. And that may be true. A baby is also at its most ignorant. It's, it's at its most helpless, right? It's It, it, it contributes the least, right? It, 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 even though this, this is the great day. They really can contribute very little. No, we're moving forward. The church in its infancy is nothing like the church that's going to be revealed. We're moving toward times that, were, that are going to be revealed that have only been prophesied about in the past and had, that have been hidden until a particular time. Listen, if we look at Revelation chapter 7, verses 9 through 10, one of the things that it does, it really gives us a little peek into this future a move of God that, I'm, that, that that you were asking about and that I'm, I'm telling you about. It said, after this, I looked and there was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages standing before the, the throne and before the Lamb. This is before the Lamb. This is not judgment. These are believers. And he said, they're robed in white with palm branches in their hands. And they cried out in a loud voice saying, salvation belongs to our God who is seated on the throne and to the Lamb. They're, they're, they're at, right at the Lamb's seat. They're at the seat of mercy. This vision is the ultimate goal of the, 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 this is the ultimate fruit, if you will, of the sharing of the gospel. This is what's going to happen. This is that future view that you'll see that is a long way from Galilee. This is a long way from just that one little town that, you know, that, that knew about, that, that, you know, maybe one city in Jerusalem that was turned upside down for a weekend. It, it took much, much more than this. Salvation. And no way belongs to just one culture, one group, one, you know, one language, you know, one race. None of those things. The good news it, 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 and it, it's the heart of the gospel is spreading that and bringing that so that we get, begin to see this beautiful picture that Christ is presenting for us of all races, all cultures, all nations coming together, worshiping and celebrating. 
And this is not going to be accomplished by the United Nations. This can't be accomplished by any work that is going to be done here by man. This can only be accomplished by Christ. This is a future view. There is a future here for the church. It's, it gets bigger than this. this. This vision that you see is the various cultures and backgrounds coming together. And that can only happen through Christ. That's the work that we're doing now that was not able to be done before. They, they, you know, Jesus did a great work on the earth. Peter, they did, you know, uh, Paul, they did great works on the earth. We're not going back there. Those are just the beginnings. You know, the, the, we've, we've meant to take this to the uttermost parts of the world. We're able through the Internet. We're able to travel, you know, through, through all manner of communication means get this word out that will realize this dream that reaches beyond our little tribal uh, you know, connections and, be, and beyond our little cultural boundaries. Listen, I want to suggest something to you. Let's look forward. Let's not look back. As, as if somehow, you know, man, I'm looking at Acts and those were the glory days. You know, man, when you look at the Gospels and people were getting healed left and right as if those were the glory days. No, the glory days is that whole countries have been converted to Christ. That, that, that there have been centuries now where Christians have gone and through, through con touched every continent with the word of God. That's the beauty of of the forward view. The vision is future. The vision is not, is forward. It's not backwards. That's not the way the Lord works. Backwards was, the, 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 let's go back to the roots of the church. The roots of the church were local. The roots of the church were regional. There was there was not the, even a thought at the root of worldwide ministry. They couldn't have conceived of it. But that's what we, we can. We, we, we're not limited. We now have a greater view and it's a worldview. So we may need to change some of our methods to accomplish the mission. But Jesus said this, and this is what Jesus, was, this is where he was going. This is that future he was telling us about. He says, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. So he doesn't say stay. He says, go, therefore, and make disciples who? Of all nations. Man, he was talking worldwide ministry from the beginning. He says, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything that I've commanded you. And remember, I'm with you always in the end of the earth. You think that that's, he says, in the end of the age. You, that's a futuristic. What, when did the age end? We're still in it. We're in the church age right now. So the, the goal here, has every nation, or all, is every person that needs to hear, have they heard? No. Is every person who was born today, do they know Christ? No. Have they heard Christ? No. We still have a work to do. So let's not look backwards as if those were our glory days. No, we've got some more, we've got glorious days that those who had lived before us would love to have seen. Let's take a look at question number three. My pastor said that he's the leader of the flock, but he's not one of the flock. I thought that we were all members of the same body. Aren't leaders a part of the flock of Jesus? Again, good question. Now, here's the thing that I want to say. I want to start this out by saying I, my answer, me, there's no disrespect to your pastor whatsoever concerning what my answer is. And I, I'm not even directing this directly to your pastor. So I want to make this clear simply because I only got a piece of the conversation. I don't know, you know, some of the other parts of the conversation. And sometimes you can jump in and answer something thinking, you know, yeah, I heard that part, but I may have missed some other explanations that he may have given. So I, I want to make sure I put that out there first. Now, taking the question that you asked me at, uh, you know, just at face value, the answer is this. We sometimes have a habit and, you know, some churches do it. Some leaders do it with themselves. Other leaders will lift up other leaders and we'll, we'll make the mistake of elevating pastors and leaders above everyone else. And that's not biblical. And I want you to get that. Respect is one thing, but lifting them above where they're supposed to be is dangerous and it's hurtful to the pastors. It's hurtful to the body. You know, nobody gets help by people being out of place. Pastors are sheep. And when I say sheep, that means they're members of the body. They work in the body. You know, listen, they have different responsibilities than some other members in the church, right? They, 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 other members of the sheep do other things, but they're part of the, listen, the CEO of Chrysler is a part of Chrysler. I know what Chrysler, I'm not sure if Chrysler even exists today, but pick a company, Apple, right? You, you still, you're, you're part of Apple. You, your, your job is as a CEO, no doubt about it. The person in, in you know, in the, the comptroller's office, that's their job. But there's no way they could say, well, I'm not, you know, I'm I'm not a member of the team. I'm not a part of the company. Oh, absolutely. G Jesus is the only one that's not a part of the flock. He is the head shepherd. He is the chief shepherd, right? So when you begin to look at who he is, you have to understand that he's the only one that takes that head position. 
He's the only one that is truly the shepherd, right? The shepherd is not one of the sheep. The shepherd guides the sheep, but that's not the pastor. You know, when you look at pastors, pastors are not chief shepherds. They, they, they're in a position where they assist this chief shepherd, shepherd, which is Jesus Christ. It's not the pastor's church. The sheep are not their flock. And, and one of the things you got to understand, this question that's there comes because we deal with hierarchy in the church and hierarchical structures that you see in the church. I'm higher than you. You know, I'm better than you. You know, I, this is this is me and this is you. All of those things originate in the world. They originate from flesh. Those are not biblical principles. Those are not biblical designs. Those were not designed by Christ. Remember, here's what Jesus said. You know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles, this is the world he's talking about, they lord it over them and their high officials exercise authority over them. That's that hierarchy that Jesus is talking about. You know how the Gentiles do. This is how they look at rulership. And that is that, that kind of has seeped into the church where we now look at it and like, well, let's look at an organizational chart because I'm here and then this person's 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 down here. And then so but surely what you have is people not looking for assignments that they have been given by God, but you have this whole idea of promotion and moving up. And yeah, I'm this today, but you know, that's not where I'm going to stay. And I'm going to move up to the next rung, and I'm going to move up to the next rung. And you just don't see that in the Bible. You don't, you don't see, you know, the deacon who's been called to be a deacon. You just don't see him saying, yeah, that's just now. I'm biding my time because, you know, that's just, that's just junior stuff. Oh, yeah, I'm called to serve over here, but I'm an usher today. But that, that's not my real anointing because, you know, I'm trying to go over there. I'm trying to move up there. That sounds like, you know, corporate America. That doesn't sound like the Bible. Dude, here's what the Lord said about that in this same scripture. He said, you know, they, they lord over it people and they exercise authority over them like that in in the world he says but not so with you instead whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant he's got to stay in that same spot right he's a member i'm a part of this uh, i'm not above you he must become your servant and it says that whoever wants to be first must be slave to all for even the son of man did not come to be served but to serve. This hierarchy that we are experiencing in the church has a stranglehold on the church, and it's strangling some churches. It's, it strangles the body. It strangles young people who are growing up in the body, who are looking and saying, eh, I'm a minister, but that's chopped liver. You know, give me a couple years and watch and see. That's why, you know, we look and complain and we wonder, like, why these so many upstarts? Well, we set up a, a situation where upstarts are born. When you set up a competitive situation when you can set up a situation where people aren't going to where they're called they're going to where they want to go when you look at those things and a person who desires the office of a bishop who desires that office who now says oh you've created a pathway for me to become whatever i want to become in the church as if that's how it works when you set that up you're going to have upstarts when you set that up you're going to have a disruption in the way that god wants it to operate he says not so with you so scripture designates one person as the head of the church that is not the bishop that is not your apostle you can love them you can love the way they preach you can love their management style but they are not the head of the church that's jesus christ the pastor the elder the bishop the apostle they have a role but they are assistants and scripture is clear about how we are to deal with these leaders we are to treat them with high regard we are to respect them we're to give honor where honor is due but that's different from setting them above everybody listen I can respect my father. I can revere him. I can look at the work he's done. I can lift him up. I can salute him in all that he's done. But if you look and say, you know, is he now a human elite? We're both men. And listen, I, as a man, I can respect that man. That's how that's supposed to be. But I understand that he's a man and that I'm a man. Then the same way here that we have built these pastors up. You know, it hurts the body because when it turns out that they're not spiritual supermen, they're just really men who've been called to do a job what they're doing, that they're not the spiritual, you know, uh, uh, you know, the, the recon forces. They're not the spiritual Green Berets. They're part of the army, just like the, like the rest of us. Then, then we'll begin to understand who they really are. And then we also get a greater glimpse of Christ. Listen, here's what Jesus said. On the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable and the parts that we think are less honorable we treat with special honor listen that that's a totally different mindset that we've got to get back to that we've got to look at all the areas in the body and look and say I, I, how can i do without that 
Do you know that, 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 I mean, when you understand what your index fingers do, you could look and say, man, I'd rather have my eyes than my index finger. You just don't understand. All you have to do is lose it. All you have to do is have a surgery. All you have to do, you know, is, is have a knee surgery. And then you realize, man, how important that knee is. Just, just have your hip out of joint. You still got your heart. You still got your eyes. But just get your hip out of joint. Lose your hearing in one ear. You still got another ear. Still have all your other senses. But just lose that hearing in one ear. One weekend. And you'll see, man, I, I didn't know how important my eyelashes were. Didn't know how important that one ear was. I had no idea that if I don't close them and open them up, I didn't know what they did. So the Bible, this truth goes here. Get this. It says the whole body joined and held together by every supporting ligament grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. Listen, I know it's going to sound all woke. You know, this is some all lives matter. But listen, the bottom line is that everybody matters. And we got to get back to that. You know, I, well, I'm just a small, I, I don't matter. But, you know, we got to lift up Bishop. You know, I mean, listen, I ain't nothing. But like he is, she is. They're the anointed ones. No, we got to get back to understand that everybody matters equally in the body of Christ. That's what separates us from the world. Everybody has a part that's indispensable. The, part, the person that preaches that sermon, how can they hear without a preacher? How can he preach that to be sent? But I can tell you right now, he can't get those words out with that part's throat. And that person who gives him a cool glass of water, the Lord says, wow, that's important. You can get a prophet's reward. That's big. If God sees it like that, we have to see it like that as well. Thanks again for that question. Let's look at, and I hope that helps too. Let's look at question number four. Satan showed all the kingdoms of the world to Jesus and said he had all the power to give to whomever he wished. Does that mean that all countries are under satanic rulership. Yes. Yeah. The truth be told, every system of this world is under satanic rulership. That doesn't mean like every political party is demonic. It uh, doesn't mean if you go around the world that every political group is demonic. <coughs> but there are systems in this world. Right? And I mean, because if Satan wasn't over the systems of this world, you couldn't have wars and rumors of war. You'd have world peace. The reason why we don't have world peace is because Jesus has given this over to Satan, who is called the God of this world. Listen, the only safe place today is in the transformed mind. Listen, here's what the Bible says. Don't be conformed to this world, right? Don't be conformed to the pattern of this world or the, or the systems of this world. That includes governments. But be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able. Then you'll be able to, to test and approve of what is God, God's will is, that good and perfect will of God. Listen, the spiritual battles that are that, that are raging that we saw in Daniel, you know, over the, you know, when, when Daniel when the, uh, Daniel was praying and the angel said, yeah, I heard your prayer, but I had to fight the, the, the prince of Tyre who was trying to, to hinder your prayers. The spiritual battles in nations are manifest themselves economically, socioeconomically. We're seeing it all over the place today. We're seeing it in the political sphere. We're seeing it with wars. We're seeing in areas of slavery all over the world. And one of the clearest indicators is what you mentioned, whether whether Satan, you know, does he control kingdoms? Well, look what's said. Let me, and I want you to see that this is that temptation in the wilderness that you mentioned. And I, I want to read just a part, part of it because there's something I want to drag out of that. It says, the devil led him up to a high place, led him up to a high place and showed him an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And he said, I will give you all their authority and splendor for it has been given to me and I can give it to anyone I want to. So if you worship me, it will all be yours. Now, here's the first thing you got to look at. Jesus never challenged it. Whenever there was a lie, Jesus challenged it right up front. Didn't matter who it was. Jesus didn't challenge, challenge this. Satan actually is the ruler of this world. He's the, the God of this world. Look at John 12, 31, right? John 16, 11. Those will tell you who Satan is. But also notice what Satan says. So we, when you understand this power, say, is Satan the ruler of kingdom? Yeah, that's kind of like being a governor, you know, of a state, right, right? But at the end of the day, there's a power above the governor, right? There, there, there's an ultimate authority that's there. So when you look at the ultimate authority here, Satan says, I can give this power, and I'll give you this a power and authority, right? He says, because it has been given to me. It has been delivered to me. This power that I operate in is actually not power I assumed on my own or earned in any way. It's been given to me. By who? By God. All Satan's power is given to him by permission. And I want you to grab hold of that. I want you to really get that. He doesn't have the autonomy to just decide, I'm going to do what I want to do. You know, I'm a king. He, he's the God of this world. 
right? He didn't get the power. He didn't get the title king of this world. He's the god of this world. Yet he's got to ask God for permission to do anything he does, right? Before man sinned, we can see that, you know, that God had given him authority and power over the earth. But after his fall, it's God's sovereign decision. I'm going to give this to Satan. He's, it, it's his will to do it. It's, it. it's part of his plan to do it. Uh, so, and as we see it unfold, God has a, a plan that's bigger than us. God, why would you give that to Satan? No, he knows what he's doing. And so Satan has been given huge power in this world, but he's not been given all power. He is not the overarching authority. He's the manager at, at that Walmart, no doubt about it. But he's not, listen, there's an authority over him. You can look at the manager and say, I want to talk to your manager. Well, guess what? Whatever Satan declares, he's got an, uh, he's got a boss. His boss's name is Jesus. So the reality is we see that Satan can make decisions, but God can override those and veto those decisions whenever he wants. It's Satan who stirred up the people with the, in the Tower of Babel to begin to build, you know, that tower, that monument to mankind, the monument to self, right? They built this little worship tower for themselves. What a God could do. He came down and toppled the whole work, shut the whole thing down. Satan wanted to get Job. He says, the Lord says, have you tried my servant Job? He says, you know, I can't get to Job. You put a hedge of protection around him. He was like, all right, you can get to him now. Let me open up the fence. All by permission. He couldn't touch anybody that the Lord didn't allow him to touch. So does Satan have power now? Sure. But it's severely limited. And, it's, it, and specifically, he can only tempt, he can only deceive the elect. But he no longer has any power over them. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 4, 4. Among whom the God of this world, He's blinded the mind of unbelievers. Get that. Only unbelievers. Does he still run kingdoms? Sure. Kingdoms where unbelievers are in charge. He runs the mind of these people group. What, what people group? Unbelievers, wherever they reign. If they're in the highest ranks, listen, Satan's got he's, he's got rule. If they're in a daycare, yeah, Satan, Satan is running it. He still has the blinded the minds of unbelievers. And it says, so that the illumination of the glorious good news about Christ, who is the image of God, might not shine through. That's for them. So does Satan still have limited power? Yeah, he's still running certain people, but not us. There are those who are free that are out. You know, we're woke. We're not in the matrix anymore. So hopefully that helps to understand. Yeah, Satan has some very limited power and he's still exercising that power today. But the ultimate authority is Christ and nothing Satan does can thwart the plan of God. Let's take a look at it. Listen, let me just give you one more example before I go there. Think of Egypt. Satan was firmly entrenched in Egypt. You know, you know, Satan heart was a part of hardening Pharaoh's heart, right? Satan was over that government of uh, that that it was idolatry. It was Satan who was also part of making sure that Pharaoh was stiffened in his resolve not to believe. But when Satan decide when when Pharaoh decided that he didn't want to let the children of Israel go, didn't they eventually get out of Egypt? When he decided he wanted to kill him, didn't Pharaoh get swallowed up in the Red Sea? When God said he's going to deliver them, didn't they go into the wilderness and leave Egypt? He said, and the, the guy you see chasing you right now, after this, you'll see him no more. Satan was swallowed. I mean, Pharaoh was swallowed up that day and we saw him no more. So hopefully you'll understand, yeah, there's limited power, but God still uses him for his divine purpose and always for our good. Let's look at our fifth and final question. I like this one. It's, well, I like them all. I, I, I love all these questions. I certainly appreciate all you guys sending these questions in. But some of these touched me in different ways because I, I, I've thought about this. I had been thinking about this. I had not had a conversation with anybody about it. And you give me this opportunity to talk about it. So I appreciate it. Is Christian numerology established as truth, such as the number seven is the number for completion or the number six is the number for man? This doesn't seem biblical or proven to even be true historically. I'm thank you for uh, bringing this historically. No, it is not true historically. It's not true biblically. This can be dangerous. This can be a very misleading practice. And I'll tell you why. There's nowhere in scripture that this is taught. There's nowhere in scripture where you'll see numerology, you know, taught where we're told in any way that this is something that we are to follow, that this is something that we are to believe in any kind of way. One of the things you'll find out about numerology is that it's arbitrary. It's subjective. You know, why did, uh, is there any place in scripture where the Lord says, and this is the reason why I use this number. And this is the reason why I use this number. No, it's subjective to us. We use it. And it, it's been used historically as a form of divination, right? To divine, to make decisions. 
the Bible is meant and designed to be authoritative. It's designed, right? It's an authority. It, and, and what you have with numerology is at best is subjective guessing. God used the number 12 and he's got, you know, there's 12 tribes and there's just 12 uh, disciples and they're going to sit on 12 thrones and there's 12 crowns. And so why did he use the number 12? What's, what's the significant? He chose the uh, 12 people, you know, 40 years in the wilderness. And then, you know, and then there's the, the seven days to complete uh, the, you know, the, the earth. And then there's the seven bowls. And then there's the seven, this, and the seven seals. And we start making numbers more significant and we begin to take them out of the bounds of, of, of the place where they're actually established as God said seven, but he doesn't say why he said seven. So when we begin to now try to figure out the mind of God using numbers, using symbols and teach them as truths, that's very, very dangerous to do. And we don't have any place where the Lord has given us any revelation concerning those, th those things. When we look and say six is the number of man, You'd have to ask yourself, where do you get that? And one of the things you'll see, this numerology, these things that begin to sift and seep into the church, that we begin to take as real, that, well, well, he's used seven, eight times. I can see a pattern. Listen, that is us saying, I figured God out. And there are things that we simply cannot know. What we can know is what he said. And we must take what he said at face value. But we can't now take symbols those things that we only know in part and then begin to add those as truths when we have in the Bible for ourselves that which is true. Let's hold on to that which is true. Listen, I certainly appreciate your question and I hope that helps you there. Numerology is not something that's biblical. Numerology is totally subjective to the person. Numerology does not figure into a pattern that the Lord has actually shown us or given us. And the fact that you can see He's used seven here. There's plenty of times when he hasn't used seven. Some of the, There's been plenty of times where the children, there weren't six of them. There weren't seven of them. There weren't 12 of them. There weren't 11 of them. The numbers are all over the place. There's they're, they're just no, nothing here that says, yeah, God always sticks with that. When he does it, it's always going to be on the seventh day, right? When when he does this, he you, when, when he's completing something, it won't be seven, but it'll be 40. Yet there's certain places where things are in that 40. Right. There's certain places where things have ended at 50. The year, you know, there's certain things in year seven. Right. The year 70. Well, here then again, the year 50. What, what do those numbers mean? We don't need to assign because that's humans trying to now box God in and to say, aha, I figured you out. When in reality, we have enough that God is saying, you don't have to figure this out. I revealed it to you. Take what I've revealed and what you do not know that I have not revealed. You don't need to know. So listen, I hope that that's a blessing to you. Thank you again for that question. I, I, you know, when you begin to look at this, you know, there's lots of word in the Bible, Zephaniah, Zechariah, talk about divination and talk about how the, the prophets lie. And this is a lie to be able to say, this is the seventh year. And you know what God always does in the seventh year? Listen, there are people who will look at them lies right now and say, I've been struggling for 10 years. What happened to my seventh year? I've been, uh, the, it's the year of Jubilee, the, I'm really going to get out because there are people in prison that have looked and said, okay, I've done that time and the doors are not open. What, what, what's the formula? There is no formula because a sovereign God does not need or require a formula, nor can there be a formula for a living sovereign God who makes decisions without the help and without even sometimes the knowledge of those he's helping. Listen. I hope that you're blessed by this today. Let's listen, continue to stay tuned. The Revelation train is going to continue to roll. We'll be back here again tomorrow at 7.30 with Bible study. Listen, I look forward to seeing you here. Well, at least having you here. I'm going to be here teaching the word of God. I hope that you're here uh, ready to share.